When Otto Octavius assails the Beyond Court building, it'll be up to Ben Riley to save the day. What'll happen next? Well, let's hop into the pages of Amazing Spider-Man issue number 85 and find out together, shall we? So then, picking up directly from where the last issue left off, an enraged Dr. Octopus has made his way to the Beyond Corporation's headquarters to unleash a pent-up and unholy vengeance upon them and Maxine Danger for daring to steal some of his Parker Industry ideas. Don't ask what ideas exactly they stole because they don't tell us. If nothing else though, this does seem to be a different sort of Dr. Octopus as he goes out of his way to not kill some of the rank and file employees, only knock them out. Well, alright, this is an interesting enough setup. It's a villain versus another villain in Maxine Danger and beyond, only we don't really get to see that idea to fruition as instead the book takes a hard right turn into absurdist comedy. As you'll remember, the Beyond Corporation isn't just involved in creating a brand new corporately bracked Spider-Man, they're also involved in multiversal shenanigans, meaning that Otto finds himself coming face to face with a talking fish, and a whole room dedicated to eldritch sandwich gods. Again, these are all funny little segments in a vacuum, but taken with the rest of the story, they represent a very odd shift in tone. Now, Ben as Spider-Man is still away tending to his wounds from his last fight with Dr. Octopus, but the Beyond Corporation isn't without defenders. We have the Daughters of the Dragon, Misty Knight and Colleen Wing, ready to take their own swings at Ock. They do well enough in a straight-up physical fight, but Ock ends up ultimately outsmarting them by locking them in another room. In fact, people greatly underestimating Dr. Octopus's amazing mental aptitudes is kind of a running theme throughout this two-parter. It's certainly one thing when Ben underestimates Dr. Octopus, because he's never fought him before, but you would think Misty Knight and Colleen Wing would do just a little bit better, right? With the daughters taken care of, it's easy enough for Ock to invade the office of Maxine Danger, who to her credit is not shook at all by this villain-to-villain heart-to-heart convo. In fact, their whole conversation ends up taking this real meta dimension wherein Maxine complains saying that Otto's motivations are petty and make absolutely no sense, and yeah, they kind of don't. Ock also gets in a good jab saying that Maxine and Beyond's whole attempt at creating a better, more marketable type of Spider-Man is an idea ripped off solely from him. Which again, good bit of meta commentary there, but should Maxine not know about the whole superior Spider-Man thing? No time to think about the implications, though, because it's at that point Ben finally manages to make the scene using his brand new glider turbo technology to get there in the blink of an eye. To Ziggler, the writer's credit, he does a good job showcasing that Ben learned a lot from his previous defeat at the hands of Doc Ock, and because of that, goes and pulls out all the stops right away at the beginning of the fight, leading the villain to the weapons R&D wing of the Beyond Corporation and opening up on him with several new gadgets designed specifically to take a villain like Doc Ock down. As a last-ditch effort, Doc manages to disengage from his own tentacles and set them to self-destruct. Ben doesn't fall for this trick twice, though, thankfully, and instead uses the distraction as an excuse to take the fight outside so he can really lay into Doc. Ben's feeling pretty good about himself right now. He defeated Dr. Octopus, one of Spider-Man's greatest foes. Maybe this means the Beyond Corporation was totally right for choosing him to fill Peter's shoes. Maybe he is a great Spider-Man. Maybe he is a great hero. Only, that's not the case, Ock says. You see, Doc actually lets Ben have a look at the stolen information drive from Beyond, and on it, he learns that the company has been psychologically profiling him from the very beginning. They picked him not because they thought he would make a great report replacement Spider-Man, but because they thought he was the easiest to manipulate into serving their purposes. This also strengthens my own personal theory that those psychiatric sessions with Dr. Kafka aren't actually meant to help Ben, but to actually make him more pliable for Beyond, but that's yet to be confirmed yet. Likewise, apparently that drive didn't have the final piece of information revealing that Beyond were the ones behind the UFO attack against Peter, yet Auk already knew that. After dropping this bombshell too, Otto just kind kind of leaves like this was always his plan, but we know it wasn't. Ben returns to Maxine Danger and tells her that Ock escaped, not that he actively let him go. He also says that the drive was destroyed during their fight, meaning that there's still probably more dark revelations for Ben to ultimately uncover, but needless to say, all of this has left an indelible mark on him. Ben is now questioning every decision he's made, and that if every victory he's won wasn't somehow manipulated from afar by beyond. As the comic ends, he punches his own reflection in the mirror, which in turn gives it the look of that 
that sunken face Spider-Man that we've seen recurring as an image throughout all of Spider-Man Beyond, which is kind of cool. And so that was Amazing Spider-Man issue number 85, everybody, and overall it was kind of all over the damn place. I didn't hate it, but I definitely felt like it could have been a lot better. Dr. Octopus's motivations for doing what he was doing were flimsy at best, a fact of which the book even jokes about and lampshade hangs, which doesn't change the fact that it's true. It's definitely good that Ben is finally through the looking glass now and knows that Beyond is not his friend and that they have been using him, but we do also run into a small problem that I didn't think we'd be getting, but we did. And that is quite simply, I think all these different writers writing Ben for Spider-Man Beyond all have their own take on his inner feelings about working for the Beyond Corporation. In some stories, he seems to completely realize that they're evil, or at least evil in the way all mega corporations are, but he thinks that maybe he can change them from the inside, or that if he's not doing the job as Spider-Man, they would have just picked someone else. And yet here in this story, he suddenly has an inflated sense of self-worth because Beyond picked him because they thought he would be the perfect replacement fill-in Spider-Man. And maybe that is true in the story as written by Ziggler, but I don't think it gels with the other stories we have read in this run so far. Or at least that's certainly not the feeling I've been getting while reading the other stories. Maybe I can't speak for everyone, but I know that's how I personally was interpreting everything. Beyond that, the art is nice, the comedy, while a little out of left field, certainly made me chuckle. All in all, it's a mixed bag, but one I would still feel comfortable giving a 6.5 out of 10. Hey there everyone, Cape Jewel again, and I want to thank you so much for watching to the end of the video. As always, if you liked what you see, be sure to like, subscribe, comment. It really helps drive engagement and helps me out too. Also, if you are a patron, which you can become for as little as a dollar a month, you will get exclusive content that no one else can ever see, and you'll get to see the Comic Multiverse podcast before anyone else too. You can check out all this and more down in the description. And until next time everyone, this has been Cape Jewel, and I'll see you all next time. Cheers.